And today we're going to um, begin our journey in Central Asia, and then we'll see how the, the, the journey develops. Uh, as we look at um, the rich linguistic and literary heritage of Bukharian Jews. Now, when I say Central Asia, I realize that um, not everybody knows <laughs> where, uh, what part of the world I'm talking about. Um, even though the name connotes, you know, Central, Central Asia, the heart of Asia, I realize that it's important to kind of um, orient ourselves geographically. So when we talk about Central Asia, we're talking about uh, this region here, I often jokingly call it the land of the stans, of the stan countries. Stan is just a suffix in Persian that means place of or land of. So we're talking about a region with um, um, that contains these various countries, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan. Um, I actually include Afghanistan, Afghanistan in my definition of Central Asia, um, it's a constructed term, but essentially it refers to um, the heart of the Asian continent at the crossroads of East Asia, South Asia, the Middle East, and Russia. And the community that we will be looking at is the deep-rooted, ancient, Persian-speaking Jewish community of this region, particularly of the southern part of Central Asia, um, known as today as Bukharian Jews. Um, some of the, the cities that we come from uh, with deep Jewish roots are cities like Samarkand and Bukhara in Uzbekistan, but also cities like Dushanbe in Tajikistan and Ashgabat and Mari in, uh, in Turkmenistan. Um, let's center our conversation. Let's root it in a bit of a historical uh, background. So um, the story of Central Asian Jews, and I'm going to use those four words back and forth, Bukharian Jews, Central Asian Jews, um, is a story that goes back millennia. Um, it really begins with the Babylonian conquest of ancient Israel, of Judea, and the subsequent exile of Jews eastward 2,600 years ago. Um, we know that several decades after this conquest, uh, another empire emerges just east of Babylon, which is present-day Iraq, essentially, uh, the Achaemenid Persian Empire. And under the rule of King Cyrus, um, Jews spread to uh, various parts of the empire, including to the easternmost parts of this Persian Empire, which is Central Asia. So about 25, 2,600 years ago, we already know that there is a presence of Jews in Central Asia. Now, through the years and through the centuries, um, there is a movement, right? It's not just one migration. After the Roman exile, there's more of a movement uh, eastward. Um, there are movements from places like Iraq and Yemen and Morocco. So the story continues and various migration waves add to, uh, central, to the presence of Jews in Central Asia. Uh, I'm really right now just kind of um, sprinting through some of the main points in history so that so that we can gain a better appreciation of language. Um, so uh, the next really big chapter after um, about a millennium of Persian uh, rule, a uh, pre-Islamic Persian rule, there's also some Greek rule at that moment, uh, at various moments as well. But the next big chapter are the Arab conquests of the region and the arrival of Islam into the region. And this is actually where we have the first examples of uh, what we would call, um, what we can call Bukharian. Uh, really, at this point, we can call it really part of broader Judeo-Persian uh, language and, and, and literature. And I'll get to it in a second, kind of. I'll tease out um, Bukharian language as a, as a kind of subgroup of Judeo-Persian in general, and I think you already had a, a, a more general class about Judeo-Persian. But we see in this region, in Afghanistan in the 8th century, and as far east as East Turkestan, also known as Xinjiang today, it's uh, um, the, um, the Turkic part of Western China, we see already from at this moment um, evidence of of this Judeo-Persian that Central Asian Jews are using, um, as I said, in Afghanistan, in parts of Western China. The next big chapter in the, in the broader story is a then subsequent revival of Persian culture after uh, the arrival of Islam and, and the influence of Arabic in the region. Uh, there's a kind of a new revival of Persian culture 
through a Islamic lens now, because that's going to be the majority um, demographically from the 600s onwards or 700s, I would say, demographically, the majority of folks living in the region are Muslims and Jews are, um, are a, uh, continue to be a demographic minority. And we also then see the rise of a Turkic, Turco-Persian literary tradition so we're, and cultural tradition. So all of these layers we see um, happening in the region because Central Asia is such a geostrategic part of the world. There are con uh, con constant conquests and uh, new empires that emerge because of its position at the crossroads of East Asia, the Middle East, South Asia, and Russia. And all of those layers will affect Bukharian Jewish or Central Asian Jewish culture and language, um, music, food. So it's important for us to really appreciate all of these layers of history, all of these empires, and, and also appreciate the fact that the story of this tiny community continues on through all those uh, periods of time. So during this period, with the revival of a Persian and then a Turco-Persian culture and empires, uh, we, see, we have more um, uh, historical evidence and documents and um, <clears throat> archival material uh, uh, emerged from uh, uh, at this time. So in the 10th century, um, uh, well, it was more recently found, but documents that date back to the 10th century, um, this happened about a decade ago, this big finding um, that has been since then called um, the, the collection of these documents that were found in caves in Afghanistan are known as the Afghan Geniza um, the Afghan Geniza, essentially, the, the, the Afghan storeroom. And it's been a real game changer in um, the Judeo-Persian Judeo -Persian research of Central Asia. The next big chapter are then um, the, the, the conquests of the region by Genghis Khan and the, Mo the Mongol conquests of the region and a rise in a Turco-Mongol uh, um, um, uh, imperial era. During this time, again, zooming in on the Jewish story, and you might have already um, learned a little bit about this in a previous session, uh, this is really the, um, uh, the heart of what we can call the golden age of Judeo-Persian literature that um, extends from Iran into Central Asia, into Afghanistan. Again, we have to understand the story of Central Asian Jews, Bukharian Jews, within a broader understanding of Jews of the Persian-speaking world. I'm a Bukharian Jew myself, and I identify as both a Central Asian Jew and as a Jew of the Persian-speaking world, essentially a Persian Jew, if you will. So just a few visuals before we move forward to the next slide. Um, here are the inscriptions of Tange Azao. Um, this uh, is the, 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 was some of the first Judeo-Persian inscriptions we see in the region, and actually some of the first Judeo-Persian inscriptions we see in general. They are in Central Asia more so than in Iran. So this is uh, inscribed on rock in, um, uh, this is located, was found in Afghanistan. Um, here is this merchant's letter uh, found in East Turkestan, right? So just east of what is present day Central Asia. Again, um, this makes sense because of the Silk Roads, the, 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 the important strategic location of Central Asia, and the fact that Central Asian Jews were migrating uh, between different parts of the region. So this friends is in Hebrew uh, writing, but this is Judeo-Persian, Central Asian Judeo-Persian. And here we have a letter from the Afghan Geniza in the 10 hundreds. Uh, this is one of the letters uh, found in the caves in Afghanistan, and it's concerning financial and family matters. So clearly um, this was used, um, uh, Judeo-Persian, and again, we'll see how it evolves into what we call distinctly Bukharian, um, was used for pragmatic purposes. It was used for communication, uh, for uh, writing uh, correspondences between merchants and and um, uh, folks dealing with financial matters. Um, so the story then continues, and again, we're zooming through the uh, uh, the history into um, uh, what is then known as the Khanate and subsequently the Emirate of Bukhara. And this is, by the way, and these this Emirate or Khanate um, roughly. Uh, contains most of the region that we're talking about where Central Asian Jews have lived in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. 
This is, by the way, where we get the name Bukharian Jews. Um, we ourselves historically did not refer to ourselves as Bukharian Jews. We refer to ourselves as Israel, Israelites, Jews. We were the Jews on the ground, right? We needed to, we didn't need to specify who we were. Um, what happens, and this often happens with uh, communities that are particularly demographic minorities, is a term then gets applied to the group, right? So as different European travelers started making their way into the region, and then later uh, Russian um, uh, imperial forces, um, this name emerged because they were observing that there was this ancient uh, Jewish minority amongst this a sea of different Muslim uh, communities. Um, and so uh, they started calling them Bukharian Jews, meaning the Jews of the Khanate or Emirate of Bukhara. Bukhara is also a city, which is what the Emirate is named after, but it doesn't just mean the Jews from that city. So that is how the name emerged. And then ultimately we kind of reclaimed it and started using it ourselves, uh, largely during um, uh, uh, Soviet times. So the word Bukharsky Yevrei in Russian, Bukharian Jew is a term that now we use, but it is relatively more modern. We know that during this time, during the second half then of the, um, of the second uh, millennium common era, um, uh, this is when, in the 15, 1600s, uh, we can start, and especially getting into the 1700s, we can start talking about the emergence of a distinct Judeo-Tajik linguistic tradition. So as I said, um, our community, Bukharian Jews, we're part of the broader Judeo-Persian world, and our language is part of the Judeo-Persian uh, um, uh, linguistic, uh, 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 you know, language family. Um, it, but with time, we have developed a more distinct Central Asian variant of our Farsi that reflects the Central Asian variant of Persian that um, Muslims were were using. We call this Tajik. Right, so Tajik is really, I wouldn't even call it another language. Linguistically, Tajik is just a Central Asian variant of um, Farsi. Dari is the Afghan variant of Farsi. So Judeo, so Bukharian is the Jewish um, variant of the Central Asian variant of Persian. So that's where the word Judeo-Tajik emerges. And then you might be asking, what does that really mean? So it reflects in, in some of the phonology, in the way that we pronounce things uh, that are a bit different uh, than in Iranian Persian. It is also reflected in some of the even grammar um, and the influence of, more influence of Turkic in our language because Uzbek is a Turkic language. And then the Bukhari and then the Judeo-Tajik uh, will obviously then have um, uh, Aramaic and Hebrew in it as well. I'm going to move forward through some of this uh, so that we, uh, um, we, we can um, cover some more. There's always so much to, to, to explore here, but this is just to whet your appetite. Um, one thing I just want to say, though, is before I talk about Russian colonialism, is that there's still, as I said before, a constant movement of Jews um, into the region from different parts of the broader Asia and even North Africa. Um, and then also, in the, an important thing to mention, in the 1800s, in the second half of the 1800s, is the participation of Bukharian Jews in the classical music in the classical Central Asian musical tradition called Shash Maqam. And we know that at this point, um, in the second half of the 1800s, uh, there are even musicians who are playing at the royal court of the Amir. And one thing that I, I didn't mention here, but I will, is that also during uh, this time, right at the eve of um, Russian colonialism, um, there is a migration of Bukharian Jews to Ottoman Palestine wealthy Bukharian Jews who migrate of their own volition along the Silk Road to Jerusalem uh, to create what is then known as the Bukharian Quarter. And we'll get to that in a second because that has real implications for the language. So again, we're talking about a cosmopolitan community, not in some backwaters, right? A community that is moving to different places 
a community that is living in important um, worldly cities and cosmopolitan cities like Samarkand and Bukhara. Then the, the next important chapter, we're now getting closer to the present period, is um, the colonialism uh, that the region experiences at the hands of Russians, Tsarist Russia, starting in the mid 1800s. Um, oh, I actually did mention here, around that time is when we have this Judeo-Persian and more specifically Judeo-Tajik, another name for Bukharian, revival in Jerusalem in the, 18, um, in the second half of the 19th century. And then the chapter that many of us know a little bit more about, which is um, the, the interesting experiment that was the Soviet Union. Now, when I mention this to people, sometimes they're actually quite um, confounded and perplexed by the fact that Bukharian Jews, we are at the intersection of, again, all of these layers of identity and all these different empires, we are simultaneously Sephardi and Mizrahi, two terms that refer to Jews with deep roots in North Africa and the Middle East and uh, Jews of the Islamic world. We're simultaneously that, and we're simultaneously part of the RSJ, Russian-speaking Jewish world, that more people often associate with Belarus or Ukraine or Russia proper. We are part of that intersection, just like Georgian Jews and the Kafkazi Jews of the Caucasus as well. Um, so a lot of that Russification, some of it was happening during the imperial Tsarist times, right? But it really uh, gets kind of cranked up a notch uh, during the Soviet uh, Union. But in the beginning years, actually, of the Soviet Union, um, there is, we can talk about another almost kind of a renaissance of distinctly Judeo-Tajik Bukharian literature. It's only for less than two decades, but it was part of the process of um, a, a Soviet policy called, called Karinizatse, indigenization, essentially spreading the, um, the um, essentially propaganda of, um, of uh, the Soviet Union and spreading the communist message and literature in the languages of each distinct ethnic group. And Bukharian Jews were seen as a distinct ethnic group that needed to learn, um, uh, that it should learn about uh, communism and socialism in, <coughs> pardon me, in their own language. And so that actually led to um, in the 20s and 30s, Bukharian language uh, schools and, and school books, primers, newspapers, and literature. Again, very much what we would call red propaganda, um, but there was a flourishing of this literature by Bukharians. Uh, now, all of this ultimately stops when uh, the Soviet Union basically decides that Okay, we're done with that part of our evolution, and um, and now we're going to stop supporting, and not just stop supporting, we're going to outlaw um, uh, writing in this distinct Jewish, Judeo-Persian, Tajik language, and that's really when we see the 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 the, the, the true kind of um, more uh, um, mighty Russification that impacted um, even my grandparents' generation, but especially my parents' generation and then also trickle down to me. And I'll maybe during the Q&A, we'll talk about how I connect to the language and how I'm a product of all of this colonization and different empires. And now the post-Soviet era um, uh, from 1991 onwards. So the big part of this, uh, the important part of this chapter is that um, Bukharian Jews essentially in mass le left um, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and uh, there was a mass migration to Israel and, um, and the U.S., and we'll get into some numbers in a second, but um, long story short, the bulk of our community now, which is about 300,000, um, live outside of our ancient place of origin. We live in Israel, we live in the U.S., also Canada and parts of Europe, um, and that has had an impact on how we connect to our language as well. A couple of photos just to really, um, you know, we, they say a photo tells, a, you know, speaks a thousand words, right? Tells a thousand words, something like that. So a few photos to, to really uh, uh, put into, you know, clear relief um, 
uh, and, and visually um, uh, allow us to appreciate uh, this community. So this is a photo that was taken in Samarkand, a very important uh, city where Bukharan Jews have lived for centuries, um, taken in 1910. Look at the beautiful robes and the kipot, right? This is uh, very much our, our tradition, our um, tradition, our sartorial tradition is uh, very, very vibrant and uh, a very colorful. Um, then we have uh, this photo, actually one of the oldest photos of um, th th that we have of Bukharian Jews celebrating what holiday? Sukkot, right? Um, in their own distinct way. But this is, uh, I show this photo as a way to really drive home the point that, you know, we are, um, we are part of the, the broader Jewish world. It's not some, you know, kind of footnote to the side. And, and seeing holidays that were celebrated by Jews around the world, I think is one way to really um, understand that, um, uh, you know, we are part of that uh, mosaic, not some exotic other. Another family also celebrating Sukkot in Samarkand several decades later. Again, if we had more time, we would close read every photo, but this is just to give you a little, a little taste. Um, this is another photo of a family celebrating Sukkot. But is this in Central Asia? No, this is in Jerusalem. Remember I told you about the Bukharian quarter that was established um, in the second half of the 1800s. By the way, that quarter still exists in Jerusalem. It's off the beaten path. Not many people know about it, but you can visit it. And it's still known as Shkunata Bukhari, the Bukharian quarter. So this is a Bukharian family celebrating Sukkot in Jerusalem over 100, sorry, over 100 years ago. And um, speaking about the quarter, this is a photo of the oldest synagogue still active in the quarter, known as the Baba Tama Synagogue. And we see again, the beautiful dress, the garb uh, that Bukharan Jews took with them as they migrated to Jerusalem. This friends is a photo that is very near and dear to my heart because it's my family. This is a photo of my family that my grandfather, may he rest in peace, preserved in incredible condition. Um, it's dated to 1903. Uh, this is my great grandmother, Shoshana. This is her brother, Yibi, her sister, Freha. And um, I, I love to show this photo again as a way for us to get a deeper understanding of, uh, of the community and, and as a living uh, and vibrant community, um, a deeper understanding of, of uh, what they wore and their um, the, the, the garb, the clothing, the way it was influenced by our surroundings. Um, and also because I like to bring my ancestors into this conversation. A few more photos of my family. Um, this is a really interesting photo, uh, uh, very apropos because we are about to start celebrating Passover. And this is a photo of Bukharian women making the masa. We say masa, it's matzah, but we say masa, um, uh, the matzah. And the year that they're doing this is 1935. Now, this was already during the onslaught on religion by Stalin. So, this is an amazing thing. This is really a political act in a way, um, doing things like this, like making religious bread was not allowed. And here they are um, baking in Bukhara. My grandfather, may he rest in peace, used to tell me um, that it, the, 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 the bread melted in your mouth. It wasn't this cardboard stripe stuff, right? It doesn't have to be, as long as it's baked under 18 minutes. It was soft, it was like alafa bread. By the way, really, I should be incorporating some Bukharian as we speak. When I said, may he rest in peace, the way we see it, say it in Bukhari, in our Central Asian, Judeo Central Asian Tajik Persian variant, uh, is we say, Khudo Khad, oh, no, sorry, Khudo Rahmat Kunad. Khudo Khad is God willing. Khudo Rahmat Kunad. Khudo means God, like in modern day Iranian Persian, Khudo, Khudo, we say, Khudo Rahmat Kunad. Uh, may God have compassion on this person. Rah rah rahmat actually comes from the Arabic Rahma which comes from the Hebrew Rahamim, right? So it's all really beautifully uh, are related. Um, okay, we have about 15 minutes, so that's great. Um, so let's uh, talk, I mean, we were actually already dove uh, through looking at the history. Uh, we've actually already uh, have gained a, a good appreciation of, um, of, the, of, of Bukharian as a, 
uh, as a language and the kind of the, the, the linguistic trajectory of 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 uh, of Buharian. Uh, but just again to say, so um, Judeo Tajik, right? That's the kind of formal linguistic term for Buh Buharian, or we call it Buhari, is an Eastern or Central Asian variant of Judeo Persian, right? Because Tajik is a Central Asian variant of Farsi, and Judeo Tajik is the Central Asian variant of, of Judeo Persian, largely intelligible with Farsi today. More so, I would say we can understand, you know, Persian uh, Persian speakers from Iran a little bit more than they can understand us, but it's it's really linguistically not its own, um, you know, it's not like a Judeo uh, uh, Iranian language. You might have learned about, you know, some of those other languages. It is a variant of of Persian. Um, in terms of Judeo Persian, mainly scholars divide Judeo Persian, and again, Bukhari is part of that, which is why I'm including it in this. Um, historical outline, there are really three main chapters. We have the early period, uh, then the classical period. Uh, we, we, I talked about the kind of the golden age that emerges in the 1300s. And then we have the modern period starting in the 1800s. Um, Judeo-Persian, including Judeo-Tajik, uh, the literature that was written in this language, right? it wasn't just a spoken language. It was also a, a, a written literary language. Um, the, the, the topics that were written, I mean, it was, it spans so many different genres. It spans the different interests of a dynamic, diverse community. We're talking about translations and commentaries of, of holy, of, of scripture, right? Of the Torah and of different books of the Hebrew Bible, original poetry, historical works, dictionaries, and even medical and scientific treatises. And it really shows, I think this is something you all have kind of gleaned from other uh, sessions, um, it really shows this incredible phenomenon of what I call a simultaneous uh, uh, process of cultural integration and resistance, right? Judeo-Persian, like also other languages like Ladino and Judeo-Arabic, it, it shows this incredible phenomenon of being influenced by our surroundings, but still finding a way to make it distinctly Jewish, whether by writing in the Hebrew script, whether by incorporating Ara uh, Aramaic and Hebrew words. So um, these are some of the main, I'm going to literally just, I'm going to put them up here and say a couple of words about it. These are some, uh, a few of, of the big um, uh, figures of, of Judeo-Persian literature, uh, starting, as we said, in the 1300s, um, people like Molana Shahin Shirazi and Emrani, but then also going into Central Asia proper, like Khoja Bukharai, Rahib uh, from Samarkand, and Yusuf Yahudi. And what they all of them did, what they all have in common, is they took um, the, they were influenced by the poetic styles of Muslim Persian uh, uh, poets and writers and some of these greats like Firdausi. They were influenced by the rhythm, by some of the, um, the, the, the structure of the poetry, some of the imagery even, the way in which the poetry would be uh, and the writing, the literature would be composed, but they set all of that to themes of the Torah. So for example, a famous Persian poet, Firdausi, wrote the Shah Nama, the epic of the Shahs. So what did, for, for example, Shahin Shirazi do? He created Bereshit Nama, the epic of Bereshit or Musa Nama, the epic of Moses. Right? And this continues on with Khoja Bukharai, writing Daniel Nama, the epic of Daniel, right? Or Hanukkah Nama. It's this really interesting, again, fusion that we see, the syncretism. This is a, uh, a written, uh, like a manuscript of um, the poem Haft Barodaron, The Seven Brothers, uh, that was written by Yusuf Yahudi. Here we see in Bukhara about the seven sons of Hana. This is a, a, a kind of a sub story of the Hanukkah story. Um, they um, decided to be, um, they chose martyrdom over uh, being um, uh, uh, assimilated into a Greek culture and being forced to, to engage in Greek idol worship. Uh, and this is not just a manuscript, but an illuminated manuscript of um, Fatnoma, which is the book of conquest by one of these wonderful poets, Emrani. Um, and this was uh, composed um, in 
in the 1400s, but this particular manuscript is from probably the 1600s. And it's, again, absolutely beautiful. We see the influence of the surroundings of cultural, of Persian art, um, not just of the poetry, but of, of visual art on the Judeo-Persian literature. Now, this is going to have a direct effect on Bukhari literature in just a second. Here's just another quick visual. We had past uh, Purim recently. So this is the poetic versification, right, in this kind of classical Persian poetic form of Megillat Esther. It's called Ardashir Noma, and uh, written by, we mentioned this person, Shahin Shirazi. This manuscript is from the uh, late 1500s, early 1600s. Again, an illuminated page. How beautiful. With Ahashverosh, he's known as Ardashir in the story, picking his new bride. Which one is Esther? Who knows? Another uh, variant of it, another, uh, you know, these manuscripts were, were being written and illustrated multiple, you know, by, by various artists. Here's just another illuminated uh, page. Um, again, a little slightly different, but we see that same scene. Now, this is all going to come together because Shimon Chacham, Rav Shimon Chacham, is this Bukharian Jewish rabbi who was born in Bukhara. He will play an important role in reviving this incredible literature that we just uh, uh, spoke about. So Shimon Hacham was born, we're back in the kind of, you know, closer to the modern time. He was born in 1843 in Bukhara and died in Jerusalem in 1910. Now, he was a jack of all trades. He was a rabbi, a translator, an editor, an author, a commentator. He had his own commentary, um, uh, Judeo Tajik commentary on the Torah, and he was a publisher. He published more than 50 books, and he was a very important figure in the field of editing and printing Judeo-Persian manuscripts. Jerusalem at this point had a printing press. Uh, Central Asia didn't yet. So he, um, and, uh, yeah, so, so he took advantage of that. And all of these, all of this treasure trove of literature that was up, to, up until this point only accessible to the wealthy because it was in manuscript form. He was now able to essentially democratize it and print, publish and print um, the, some of the some of what we've already discussed. Shahin Shirazi's beautiful poetry from 700 years ago, right? Or at, at, at that point, we'll say you know 600 years ago. Yeah, and um, and then he sent that en masse to the communities back in Iran, Afghanistan, and Central Asia. The other interesting thing about him, important, is that he vocalized his books. And the vocalization, the short vowels, nekudot, we call them in Hebrew, reflect the distinct Judeo-Tajik pronunciation of Bukharian. As I also said, he's one of the founders of the Bukharian Quarter in Jerusalem. And um, again, didn't just... Uh, publish religious books, but secular literature as well, including a Bukharian Judeo-Tajik translation of 1001 Nights and Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors. Quite impressive. This is the printed version of Ardashir Noma, uh, the, ma the manuscript that we saw several slides ago that was written in the 1300s. But this is our Bukharian beloved rabbi. He's, I, he's like a, I don't know, I feel like he's a, my guru. I, I dream about him. I'm, I, I, he's, he, he's played a very important uh, role in my um, uh, love and appreciation of Bukharian Jewish history because of what he accomplished. And sadly, very few people know about him. But this postage stamp, by the way, shows, um, this is an Israeli postage stamp, that you know he was recognized as an important figure in early Israel, I I Israeli history. This is a printed version of Adashir Noma published by Shimon Chacham in the Bukharian vocalization. This, friends, again, this is all Farsi, right? In Hebrew script or Bukhari, we can call it. Um, and these are couplets. They are rhyming couplets that go on for hundreds and hundreds of lines. Here's another thing that he published. Uh, he reprinted Musa Noma, the Epic of Moses, written by uh, originally Molana Shahin. We have it right here, Shahin Shirazi published by Shimon Chacham. And then he had his own tafsir, his own translation of the Torah in the Central Asian Persian uh, uh, variant that was used at that time. And so we have here in Hebrew, we have it in Aramaic, and then here we have it in Judeo-Tajik or Bukhari. And I'm going to read for you the first line so you get a feel for it. 
در اول بیافرید خدای از مر آن آسمان و از مر آن زمین It's literally a, a word for word translation in our kind of variant of Farsi of the first sentence of Bereshit, um, the first uh, portion, Torah portion of the book of Genesis. Uh, many more things that he published. Again, we are going to uh, kind of zoom uh, through it, but just to say here, for example, he, he, so this was his translation of, it's, 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 it's another uh, Bukhar, um, ta, Bukhari Judeo-Tajik translation of a book called Targum Sheni, but we refer to it as Safat Farsi, as the Persian language. And it's, it's really important to mention that. But even this word Bukharian, again, it's part of something that was kind of imposed upon us, but we saw ourselves as part of the broader Judeo-Persian world. Um, this was an early printing and then a reprinting of a book that compiled the Haggadah. This was very Passover appropriate, uh, but also with the laws of Passover and the laws surrounding the month of Nisan. Again, published by whom? Shimon Chacham. Where? Here in Jerusalem. In that book, there were various things like a translation of um, the sayings of the fathers, Pirkei Avot, Im Hatafsir, in what? Belashon Farsi, with translation in the Persian language, or Parsi, it would have been. And it says here, Shinehagul Longdim Bire Bukhara, Abishabatot Ben Taim Ben Pesah Leatzeret. There was customary for uh, uh, those, uh, for folks to learn in the cities of Bukhara and its surroundings between the Sabbaths of Passover and Shavuot. So it's appropriate then for him to put it in that bigger um, Passover, Hukata Pesach anthology. Also a Judeo-Persian, uh, Judeo-Tajik, Bukharian translation of the Song of Songs that also would be recited between uh, a Passover and um, Shavuot. Now we're going to focus on uh, um, this is something really special. This uh, uh, is uh, in that same book that Jumon Ham published for Passover. This comes towards the end of the Haggadah, of the Seder, right, in the Haggadah. Um, it's the song that many of us know um, in, in maybe in Hebrew, but it actually has been translated by different communities um, in their own distinct Jewish languages. This is the Judeo-Tajik Bukharian version of Ehad Mi Yodea, who knows one. We call it Yakumin Ki Medonad. And literally, it's a word-for-word -word translation of who knows one, I know one, one is God, who knows two, I know two, two are the tablets. So here, I'll read for you, um, I'll read for you the fifth one. Panjumin Ki Medonad. Anjumin man medonam. Who knows the fifth? For some reason, it's fifth, not five. I know the fifth. Panjumin panj sifre Torah. The fifth are the five books of the Torah. By the way, the ja is marked by putting a little dot above the gimel. Chorumin chor modaron. Four are the four mothers. The cha was marked by putting a little chupchik next to the gimel. Sehumin se padaron. Three are the three fathers. Do you mean two are the two tablets? Yakumin Chudoy Rabul Olamin. And the first is God, a master of all worlds. By the way, Rabul Olamin, this is from the Arabic Rabul Alamin. So we see also the Arabic influence in here. There's some Turkic influence. And in spoken Bukharian, there's also Russian influence. So let's listen. This is a later reprinting of it. Let's listen to this song. This is going to be. Um, we're going to hear Yakumin Kimadonad played with traditional Central Asian instruments by some of the most accomplished Shash Makam. If you remember, I said this is the classical Central Asian music that Bukharian Jews played a role in and played uh, along with their Muslim um, colleagues. Um, so we're going to hear these Shash Makam Bukharian musicians sing Yakumin Kimadonad. And I made a YouTube video of it. <laughs> so all of these, again, the, the, you know, new technology meets the, meets the old. It's, it's all here. So let's listen to just a minute or two.
and I'm gonna skip. Now this is in pretty classical Persian, uh, and so you would think maybe it's also sung by Persian-speaking Jews of Iran uh, or Afghanistan, but it's actually very distinct to the Bukhari and Jewish tradition. <laughs> 